This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. Grace Ormsby here bringing you another episode and another investor story, which I think is, you know, bread and butter of what we do here at Smart Property Investment and just so important to be shining a light on these people that are doing a great job at what they're doing. And and someone who I've actually pulled back onto the show for this episode, you may have listened pretty recently. We had the Chief Economist of PRD Real Estate on the show, Dr. Diaswadi Mardiasmo. I've actually brought her back in because not only is she involved in this world day-to-day working as a chief economist, but she's also got a property portfolio of herself and knows the importance and the value of financial stability and financial security. So Asti, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time again. It was only a couple of weeks ago that we last spoke, wasn't it? It was. Hello, everybody. And hello, Grace. Thank you so much for having me back. I am super, super excited for this episode. Um, I think it's a really, really important one and something that we do need to talk about. Yeah, we were just talking before we did jump on air. Um, We don't really get as many female investors who are not only investing well, I mean, they're they're out there, but they don't want to be telling their stories. But I think it is really, really important that we do be getting female voices out there. So if you are a female investor, you know, listening along and going, maybe I do actually have a story to tell, reach out. We want to be hearing from you. It's always important to be, you know, showing females that they can be just as financially secure as the men and 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 be doing, you know, they're doing such a great job doing so. And dear Swati, you are a prime example of that. How did you actually, you know, get involved in property investing in the first place? Yeah, so I am definitely a property investor. I own my own home um, in Acacia Ridge here in Brisbane. And I have a unit in Indrapilly, again, also in Brisbane. For those of you who may not know, Acacia Ridge is roughly about half an hour out of the Brisbane CBD. And that's where my ho- my own home is. Like I have a I love my home. I bought it back in 2013, early 2014. It's about 800 square meters, two stories, uh, six bedrooms, three bathrooms, which seems very palatial, but, um, (laughs) you know, out in Acacia Ridge, which is a little bit far away from the CBD. And that was the affordability perspective that came into play. Uh, The fact that we were able to get more bang for buck, you know, just in terms of pricing. And I invested and I have another property. It's a three-bedroom, two-bathroom apartment in Indrapilly. That was a brand new off-the-plan purchase. And this is literally, for those of you who may not know, Indrapilly is probably about 10 minutes out of the CBD. And the location of the apartment is literally across the road from the big, massive shopping center. So that's the current, what's current in the current portfolio. And I have been looking at other potential purchases as well all around Australia, particularly in regional areas for the affordability side of it from the rental return perspective. So, yeah, definitely I am. Um, I guess I can say that with you proud, are. loud, yeah. and like, you know, beating the drums that I'm a female investor. And you know, the reason why I got into it, um, it really, to be honest, started with another female, aka my mother. So my mother, you know, she said to me when I was probably about 18, after I finished high school, and that was back in Indonesia, and I was just about to start bachelor degree here in Australia. And I remember her saying to me, go as high as you can when it comes to your education, so that you will feel that you're equal to everyone that you meet. And she also said to me, start building your financial savviness, start building your financial portfolio so that when you do decide to get married and, you know, start talking about financials, you also feel equal to your husband. And so it kind of started from there. Like she planted those seeds about the whole feeling equal and feeling that you have your own sort of like 
assets behind you to make you feel. And, and she was completely right. I did feel equal, whether it's from a workplace perspective, you know, education perspective, financial position perspective. It did make me feel equal. Mm. Some pretty sage advice there from your mum, Asti. What made you go property? Is that avenue for me to achieve that financial security? Well, property, fine. Interesting enough, property was not the first that I dabbled in. The first that I dabbled in was, um, this might sound cliche, was jewellery. Because my mother said, you know, you know and everyone kind of knows the whole, you know, diamonds are a girl's best friend and all this kind of thing, right? And um, my mum told me that, you know, when times were tough, when my dad and was uh, and we were all in the UK and he was doing his PhD, she was actually able to sell her jewelry to be able to help feed the family. And so because of that, I thought, okay, so there must be value in jewelry. Like, you know, it's easier to sell. I, I, I started learning where and how to invest in good jewelry, like what sort of carrot in gold, what sort of clarity, you know, all of these sorts of things when it comes to diamonds. And I, that's where I started first, you know, and I remember I was in a bit of a strife. This was probably in my second year of master's and I was able to sell a amazing, which, you know, I still think about every day, a gold bangle with like, I think, four or five little diamonds in it for about double the price because of the carrot, you know, because here in Australia, a lot of the jewelry is nine carats, Mm. but in Indonesia, a lot of the jewelry is 18 carat above. And so my bangle was 18 carat in gold and it had really good diamonds in it. And I was able to sell it for almost double the price. And that actually meant that I could live for the next two months or so in terms of paying rent. And so that paid off in terms of that. And I realized, you know, that investing in something is key mm-hmm. when it comes to back up like financial contingency. And, you know, when you do have a little bit of money, putting it away for another time. And then I thought to myself, okay, so if I can buy jewelry, which is you know, cheaper than a house, of course, and I can sell it and it can definitely help me. How, what other investment types, what other stock can I go into that will help me set up financially? And I spoke to dad and I remember my dad was saying to me, well, I have this, this, this in my portfolio in terms of this house or this land or whatever, which is part of my retirement plan. And so I thought, well, Hmm. So maybe that's the road that I also need to be going down into, you know, and I started looking into it because I'm a researcher by trade, interestingly. Mm. Um, I'm an economist and a researcher by trade, even though I do work for a real estate company. My first sort of like trade is research and economics. And when I looked into what sort of stock or what sort of portfolios have the most resilient growth, the less volatile and the higher capital growth, the answer was either house or land. And so that's where I started going right. So that means I, you know, my first purchase needs to be a house because that means that not only will I have a place for myself, but it is also the investment portfolio that after doing all of my checks and balances and looking into things is the one that holds resilient and the one that is less fluctuative. We don't, you know, in terms of population growth and everything, the amount of houses that gets built is less and less and less each year. And then it will become a a scarce commodity in the future for capital growth. So that was kind of my way of thinking and how I got into property and how I got into a house first and wanting to be able to buy a house and then after that as you say kind of like the rest is history there you go we're going to take a quick break there but we'll be back soon to talk more with dr diaswadi marty asmo see you on the other side 
Welcome back to this episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. We are joined by Dr. Diaswadi Marty Asmo, a property investor who has been doing some pretty amazing things. And I know you're about to buy your next property, Diaswadi, but before we talk about that, I know that you have been married and separated. And yes. for a lot of women, that would spell a lot of financial uncertainty and fear. But as you said, the advice from your mom was to, you know, come into that marriage on equal footing. And and it sounds like that's what you did do. Yeah, definitely. Look, I'm going to be very, very honest here. It wasn't easy when I sort of presented the fact that, look, I do want to buy my own home. I want to have my own home. And, you know, at the time there was a choice of, well, where do we live? And I was like, well, I have my own home. Um, I'm about to buy a home and I am happy for all of us to be living in my own home, but I do have a condition in which I'm the one paying the mortgage 100%. And the reason why I wanted to do that was it was a safeguard to myself in the sense that if anything ever does happen, because, you know, nobody gets married because they wanted to get divorced, right? No, you know, like no. My, No, you know, like my thought was that, you know, till death do us apart, you know, nothing changes, you know, all of that kind of thing. But at the same time, I knew that I had to be smart because I have seen quite a lot of other females, other women, whether it's my friends, whether it's my own family members, acquaintances, where things have gone wrong in their marriage or things have gone pear-shaped and they've been left like you said, in that uncertain terms, or I've seen them stay in relationships or in marriages due to financial reasons, due to not being able to, you know, have a place to stay or any of that kind of thing. And so I realized, you know, as I'm what people will call a romantic realist, I am a romantic, you know, I love love. Um, I'm the first person um, to say that, you know, everyone asks me, so do you, do you want to get married again? And I'm said, hell yeah. Like, you know, I'll get married again, of course. And so I am a romantic, but at the same time, I'm also a realist. And so it was difficult having that conversation of going, look, you know, I'm more than happy for all of us to live together, use the house as a base. Um, we can, you, you contribute in terms of bills, you know, like I said, electricity and phone and all that sort of stuff. I'll handle the mortgage. And I did want it to set it up that way because I wanted to protect my asset. Mm. I wanted to make sure that if anything does happen, then it will be mine. You know, I wanted to be able to ensure that I can safeguard not only my asset, but also my financial future. Because finances is the number one cause of tension in a household. It is the number one cause in, you know, couples fighting, in married couples separating, it is finance. And so, you know, I, I did learn from that. And yeah, it was, it wasn't the most romantic conversation to be having with your future husband or current husband, but it is a conversation that needs to be have. And it has, and you know, I I was very clear it has nothing to do with romance. It has nothing to do with feelings of less love or anything like that. It was more a safeguard because I was being realistic. Mm -hmm. And your former partner, I'm assuming, had his own, you know, you and yes, exactly. You separate so financial did, plans. Um, yeah, so we did come into it in an equal footing because when we first got into a relationship, I was a student and he was working. And so he already had his own assets. So he has his own home. He has his own investment portfolio. And he was starting a business at the time. And so he had his own assets. And I wanted to, again, you know, my mom always reminded me, make sure you're on equal footing, you know, because money and finance is the one sticky point in a relationship, in a marriage, where it can sometimes be confused or translated into power. And so... You know, she always said to me, make sure you have that equal footing because you want to be equal in terms of feeling being equal to your husband. And so me having my own portfolio 
established that. It helped me actually feel equal. It helped me feel like we are partners 50-50. You know, I had equal say, you know, and it wasn't just about owning my own property. It was, you know, the way that we set it up was that, you know, we each had our own accounts in terms of our salaries and things like that. We do have a joint account that we both contribute equally to for household expenses when we had our child for, and even still up to now for children expenses. So all of that is still joint, but we, I maintained a separate entity when it comes to finances. And it really did help in terms of that equality feeling and also the power in the relationship as well. You pretty much answered my next question there too, Asti, which was about, you know, was there anything that was joint? You know, did you actually, apart from putting your finances together for children, were there any investments that you did make together or or was that just one area where you were like, no, that's completely separate? We did talk about some joint investments and I'm open to that. You know, we didn't get to make any joint investments throughout the time. You know, he had his own business. I was working. We did have joint expenses when it comes to the house. We did have a joint account when it comes to, you know, children and also everything else that the house might need. So all of that was joint. But, you know, I talked to my current partner now, you know, about finances. And, you know, we've both It's funny, though, because we've been friends for about 13 odd years and um, we've been together for almost three years now. And we are starting to, you know, talk about joining households and he has his own investment portfolio, I think probably even bigger than mine. And I have my own investment portfolio. And we've also been talking about, okay, so what do we do with our portfolios? You know, whether we keep it separate, if we are going to go joint into a family home or other investments, how are we going to deal with that? And I'm very blessed in the sense that I found a partner who is also on the same wavelength. We're both romantic realists in the sense that if there are any joint properties or joint investments, then we are both going to be lawyering up and we are both going to be creating an agreement, a legally binding agreement on how this particular investment property, whether it's property, whether it's a business, um, I know that we're talking about property right now, but how is this investment property going to be treated? You know, and I've said to him more than once now that I don't want to go into a joint investment property where one of us have a higher investment amount in that property. I want it to be equal so that we have equal say, we have equal power, so to speak. We have equal decision-making rights. So that was my number one stipulation was that it has to be 50-50. It can't be, you know, if it's say, if the deposit for the house is say $100,000, we have to be putting 50K each into it. So that brings us into an equal footing. And also then having that legally binding agreement on how do we treat expenses, rental income, if we were to sell it, you know, after all said and done in terms of, you know, taxes and fees and all this sort of stuff, what will happen to the money? So it's interesting though, Grace, whenever I talk like this, the first thing that a lot of people have said to me, you sound very cold. Do you, are you sure that, you know, <laughs> you, you are a romantic? And I'm like, trust me, I am. I am like the biggest romantic in the world. But I am also very realistic mm-hmm. in the sense that things can get messy. And anything that is money related does need to go into like a legal agreement. It needs to be looked after really well. And I'm really glad that you did bring up the lawyer part. And obviously, you know, separations are always messy. There's, I don't think anyone can really avoid that at all, but you do want to make it as easy and straightforward as possible because at the end of the day, the emotional turmoil is hard enough. You don't need to be adding in anything else around finance. You know, that's not where you want your focus to be at that time. It's already hard enough. Sounds like you, you're going great with your, your current partner at the moment, but just to go back a little bit of a step, when you did separate with your former husband, 
what did that process end up looking like? Because there's probably people, you know, wondering I or they're out there thinking, I do have an investment portfolio. I'm worried about going through this process because it could be quite messy. It could become quite mm-hmm. a big ordeal. Yeah. Um, obviously having the structures in place did make it much more straightforward for you, but but what did that still look like? So, okay, so the very first time that I had my legal consultation, and that's always the first thing that I say to everyone, don't be afraid to lawyer up, mm-hmm. you know, because these are the people that can really assist you with your options. And what does the law actually say? I'm a bit, I'm blessed because I, uh, you know, my PhD is in economics and law. So I'm quite used to reading a lot of legal text and, you know, deciphering kind of like policies and legalities and stuff like that. But other friends that have, you know, and, you know, it breaks my heart to say this, but since my own divorce, I think I've assisted about four or five other close friends as they went through their divorce. (laughs) Sis. <laughs> and um, you know, that was my very first thing is do not be afraid to speak to a lawyer. Do not be afraid to lawyer up. And I remember in terms of the whole financial thing, you, you know, my lawyer sat me down and said, okay, you've got two choices. You can either go to court and let the court sort it out. And that will basically look like you have to submit everything that you have. He has to submit everything that he has. There's a formula that takes into account what are your assets, what are your liabilities, what is your life expectancy, what is your income potential, like earning potential income one. Um, So there's all of this sort of like parts of the equation that will then at the end of it kind of spits out, you know, who gets what how much if someone has to pay someone or, you know, anything like that. So there is that legal side of it where you can let the court deal with it. And it's a matter of you then, you know, providing all the documents that they need and your um, partner also is doing that. The other side of it is that you can create a legally binding, like a legally financial binding agreement, and that's to avoid going to court. Because court costs are costly. It's very costly. And like you said, we're already dealing with the emotional anguish, especially if there's children involved, then also other parts of, you know, child support and child management, co-parenting, you know, all of that. That is another whole level together. But, you know, having a financial binding agreement is basically where you both come to an agreement outside of court on what is it, like who will get what, who will get which, whichever monetary or money that is available in the pot, so to speak, in any joint accounts, um, and how will that look like? I was very straightforward. I instructed my lawyers to go, what I am requesting is everything that is in my name to come back to me mm-hmm. and everything that is in his name to go back to him. So all the properties and all the investments that I have, salary that I have, assets, you know, like car, jewelry, you know, all of that kind of thing that is in my name comes back to me. And anything that he has, car, motorbike, business, you know, homes, any property that is fully in his name, go back to him. And so... For me, that to me was the easiest way of splitting all finances and joint account, whatever's in the pot, whatever's in the account, 50-50. And so to me, that was, I, at the time, I believe that not only was that the easiest, it was also the most fair and it will quicken the process because then it meant that I could then concentrate on rebuilding my life whilst also having a safeguard financially of all of the items that I do own uh, and that are in my name to come back to me. So that meant that we were able to avoid court. We were able to avoid a very, because, you know, court battles when it comes to property settlement can go years. It can go, 
it's not a straightforward like in and out, you do it in a week, you do it in a month kind of thing. Sometimes waiting for a court date can be six months. And especially back when it was COVID time, it can take up to six to nine months. And, you know, doing that whole emotional, mental sort of like thing for six or nine months, it's, it can Draining. destroy somebody. And so I went for, okay, what is the easiest, what is the quickest, easiest way to do this? I understand that I may not get my full rights of whatever it might be because, you know, husband and wife been together for a long time, all that kind of thing. But I figured, I thought, okay, if I can have everything that I do on back, then that means I've got my job, I have my salary, I have my home that I bought, and I have my, you know, investments. That'll do. Yeah? Like, for me, that was like, that was equal, fair, no shadiness, Mm. no trying to hide anything, fair, walk away. And that is the importance of coming in on that equal footing, I'm guessing. Yes. You know, you were able to do that and you felt comfortable with that because you had come in with all of that to begin with. Definitely. And then so it wasn't as messy, you know. It wasn't as, well, what do you, you know, what does that one want to do? What does that one want to do? Because it's two ways to equality, Grace. There's the equality from a real transactional value of like I have a home, he has a house. I have a salary, he has an income, you know, that's your transactional sort of like, you know, equality, right? But then there's also that economic sort of like what we call, what what us economists call economic cost, which is the things that you don't see, which is the intangibles. Mm -hmm. And that's the, I think to an, an extent, it's the more important equality. Because I felt equal to being able to ask for this is what I want. This is what I need. This is what I believe is fair. And I did play fair. You know, I did, you know, play 50, you know, whatever I own, go back to me, whatever you own, go back to you. So it is a fair split. But because there's that intangible equality feeling, it made me brave, I suppose. Or it made me feel like it's okay to ask for these things Mm. and it's okay to demand almost for these things because we are on equal footing. And I love that you've taken that into that next relationship as well and and you're fully prepared to do it the same way because it worked for you. I think that's important to note too. And we we previously had a discussion and I think it's worth raising now. Prenups don't mean anything, do they? No, not in Australia. Everyone asked me, everyone asked me, they go to me, but, if, but you know, you have a prenup, right? And I said, you do realise that they don't do anything here in Australia. Um, family law in Australia does not actually, re, you know, recognise prenups. It's um, you can have a financially binding agreement or some sort of agreement prior But then there's a lot of family law that does come into it as time goes by and especially as children come along as well. You know, prenups is more of an American idea and it holds more weight in an American court system. But here in Australia, not so much. And so when, you know, when someone says about prenups, I kind of go, Look, it's great for you to have that if you, that is what you want, if that makes you feel more comfortable. Just remember, though, that when it comes to family law, there will be other things that come into play and there will be other things that can complicate, you know, a family, uh, like a, a prenup, I guess, or a financially binding agreement or any legal binding agreement, especially when children comes along. And if there are any other purchases, or any investments or any joint monetized kind of thing that you and your husband do go into. So, yeah. I mean, in one way it might start that conversation for people, but I guess this, you know, one key thing to take away from this episode to anyone listening is that you cannot rely on that document to, you know, to provide for in the unfortunate case of a separation, you cannot be relying on that kind of document. No, not 100% for sure. Not 100%. Um, It might give you some basis, but not when it comes 
to actually then being executed and carried out. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be giving any financial or legal no, advice. No, yes, this is just that not, that's not, you know, that's my, that's not my forte. It's more speaking from experience of my own, you know, everything that has gone right now. Mm. And, you know, with my current partner, we have talked about buying things together. And I said to him, and I remember saying to him, now you do realize that I want a proper business deal out of this. <laughs> you know, we're going to be doing up papers. You know, it's not just going to be, you know, a, and I, I still don't know why it's still being called this. It's not going to be a gentleman handshake. No, no. <laughs> you know, this is going to be proper lawyer business agreement you know and you know we'll we'll do the we'll have like a romantic dinner after we sign the agreement but but not during <laughs> not during well because well have you already got a lawyer and like you know is it something that you sort of need to be proactive and, and ahead of the time for is it just when you do have those like conversations as it goes look I mean I think if you are a property investor having a lawyer actually builds your confidence because at the end of the day, when it comes to property transactions, you are going to need a lawyer anyway. You know, any property transactions involve a conveyancer. And so if you are someone who's going to be repeatedly purchasing property, wheeling and dealing, so to speak, when it comes to property investments, it does pay, I guess. And it, for me, I have a lawyer, I have an accountant and you know, knowing that you have those sort of like people in your team. And I always call them people in my team because, you know, everyone is kind of like working together to make sure that I'm looked after kind of thing. For sure. It builds your confidence knowing that you have a lawyer or an accountant in your team that knows your business, that is well-versed in your affairs, that is well-versed in how you handle your money, where your investments are, And, you know, they have all of the background, they have all of the paperwork, and you're not having to be shopping lawyers every single time that you do a transaction or every single time that you want to be, you know, doing an agreement with somebody. Um, And I think, to be honest with you, that is something that when, I'm not just talking females, any property investor would need, but particularly in investors, female investors would need on their team. Only about 42% of female investors feel confident on their ability to actually invest. And only... And that's pretty low. And that's pretty low. And and half. As of 2021, only 33% of women actually see themselves as investors and only 42% feel confident in their ability to save for future milestones like retirement. And that's quite low, right? We're talking about, if we're talking, if we're sampling 10 women, that's only three women saying that they're female investors and only four or five women at the very most feeling confident that they can save for their retirement and that they they know the ways of property investment and being able to help them to do so. So having that team of accountants, of lawyers that can, my lawyer is a dual. So my lawyer does family law and property law as well, which really helps with, you know, creating agreements with partners. And so she's well versed in that. And so having that sort of people in your team does help in to inter- of confidence. Some great insight there. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be back soon to, to keep discussing this topic because there's, there is so much we can still be unpacking. We'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to this episode of the Smart Property Investment Show. We're joined by Dr. Diaswadi Marty Asmo, talking all about being a female investor and her experience. And I think it is so it shouldn't be fascinating to be talking through all this with you. And it's really exciting to me to be, you know, uncovering this experience, Asti, because it's it's your lived experience. And there's probably thousands of other women out there that are in the same boat. And we we just don't hear these stories enough. But female investors, you mentioned just before the break, aren't as confident. You know, they're less likely to even think of themselves as property investors, even if they own property. And that's exactly what they are. But 
and we just sort of don't have the same confidence and perception of ourselves when we're out there property investing. Yeah. Is it changing? Do you think we're seeing, you know, it become more of a an equal footing like in your own experience? Look, I definitely think it's changing. The stats say so. So women made up about 45% of all new investors in Australia last year. And that's up from 31% among those who started five to 10 years ago. So if we think about it, you know, we've gone up from about 31% to 45% in the space of, you know, 12 months. So that's a really great thing to see. You know, we're definitely seeing more female investors coming into the market. They're getting more confident. You know, for some reason, the hashtag boss babe is like literally coming into my head right now. But we are definitely seeing more movement in terms of females and females going into property investment, females being more financially savvy, females thinking more about their financial future, what they want to do when they retire, and how are they going to be able to provide for the lifestyle that they currently have. And it goes hand in hand as well with females marrying later, you know, about 10 years ago, the average age of females marrying is about 25, 27. Now we've gone up to 31, 32. And so females are marrying later, you know, there's more focus on career and being able to bring in the money, so to speak, and being having that financial stability. And so because of that, movement, we are definitely seeing females becoming more and more and more aware and also more and more and more inclined to talking about finances, to talking about what is your super currently doing for you? How can you actually safeguard your finances and how can you prepare for retirement? So we are definitely seeing that. It it is increasing, which is amazing to see. I know, for example, from my own experience, when I first came to Australia back in 20, oh, not 2022, that's this year, that's this in year. 2002. Oh my goodness. 20 years so ago, I've been two Australia decades. For 20 years. Oh my Lord. Okay. So when I first came to Australia in 2002, and even when I started, when I graduated from my PhD in 2012, when I started this job back in 2014, I have definitely seen. Nowadays, my calendar is full of, you know, women-led, women-based, finance for women, retirement for women, super for women, property investment for women, those sort of invites, those sort of events, those sort of seminars that I did not see at all 10 years ago, that I did not see much of five years ago, you know. So definitely we are seeing it gaining traction and I think we need to be more open about the number of female investors that are out there. What does it mean? How do we start? And I think that's the key part, Grace, It's how do we start and what does that mean when it comes to if we are in a relationship or if we're married or we're entering into a marriage, what does that mean for us as females? How does that relate to the dynamics, you know, the the family dynamics, the relationship dynamics? Because I am going to be very honest about this. Um, When I came out of my own marriage, I had two very different feedback. I had half of my friends saying that's well you know you're too independent you have you're too equal you're too independent men will be scared they will be too dominated they you know they wouldn't want to you know and funnily enough you know this takes me back to a sex in the city episode where Charlotte basically said to all of the girls saying, no man wants it if you are too financially independent. Why do you think I rent and not own? And I think this was around the time that Carrie was trying to figure out how to buy her own co-op apartment Mm. and that 
you know, Miranda has her own apartment and she was having trouble in finding love. And so, you know, I got that feedback of like, you're too independent. But at the same time, I also had the flip side of like, oh my God, thank God that you're independent. And thank God that you have a financially savvy head on your shoulder because then it means we can actually work together in a partnership to create a life together. And so, you know, I feel, you know, it's very interesting to me and I do feel sometimes a little bit torn right, torn left about the perception of a female who is independent, who is financially savvy, who is an investor of themselves. And, you know, I'm very lucky in my current relationship, but I do know of other females who have held back from letting people know that they are financial investors or that they do own property because they want to protect that image of, like, you know, being more attractive to the other, to whoever it is, whether it's another female or a male. And so it's kind of... It's a very, I think, deep-rooted issue as well, going back to like years, years and years before us in terms of that dynamic between male and female in society and in relationships as well. I just can't believe that Sex and the City episode. <laughs> like, isn't that, I, it's so it's bad that that was. Still, it the, is still in my head. That that's the prevalent, pervasive thought that, you know, has plagued us for so long and you know it isn't fair it isn't a fair thought that you know people are still stuck in that perception of things because things have changed and you know there is so much freedom for women to be going out there and investing and I really hope that people listening to this episode are feeling inspired by your story Asti because it is an incredible one and I think it's so important for us to be hearing about things like this you know we we do talk about so much joining of finances through marriage and things but it doesn't have to be it, it will work for some people. It's not going to work for everyone. And if you yeah. are coming, especially if you are coming into a relationship with your assets already within your name. So yeah. super exciting for you, though, that you've got um, some thoughts for where you're going next. And obviously oh it's in the work, but, but what's sort of in the plan for property investing next for you? Oh, my goodness. It is such an exciting time. Being in my current role, it has really opened me to like all the possibilities of investment. You know, beforehand, uh, just to be completely honest with you, you know, going into property, I was thinking, you know, this is what my dad used to do, just buy the house, buy some land, and that's it, right? And because I live in Brisbane, you know, I'm a foreigner, you know, that's what I know, you know, Brisbane. And now that I am in this role and I am exposed to so many different parts of Australia, it's literally like it's an investment playground at the moment. We all know that there is a rental crisis. We all know that vacancy rates are at historic low in most places and particularly in regional Australia. And that is where I'm targeting because as an investor, you know, I hold on to three sort of like main things. One, affordability in price, because I don't want to be living outside of my means. Two, rental returns in terms of rental yield, making sure that it's high or it's going up. And three, vacancy rates, because vacancy rates determine how quickly your rental property is going to be occupied. And as an investor, you want that cash flow to keep on going, right? Because that cash flow is what then determines your serviceability if you are going for another loan to buy another investment property. And so, you know, those are the three things that I always have to look at. And at the moment, I am casting my net to regional Australia. I'm thinking regional Queensland, places like Mackay, Sundays you know, regional New South Wales, places like Upper Hunter, anywhere in the Hunter region, all the way to regional Victoria, like Bendigo, Ballarat, Horsham, um, and regional Tasmania as well. And so I'm passing my net wide. I've started to actually look at 
some properties in Whit Sundays and also in Tasmania and Victoria. Again, from an affordability perspective, rental yield perspective, and also vacancy rates perspective. And, you know, my first investment property is three bedrooms, two bathroom apartment in Indrapilly. And I had great success with that, you know, because the type of stock, it's close to the city. It's not a two bedroom or a one bedroom. It's actually a three bedroom unit, which means that it opens up to more demographics. Absolutely. So it's not just, you know, you can have three professionals in there or three students, or you can have a family with a young child. You know, I'm not in such a big unit apartment complex. I have uh, the, this one has rooftop pool, you know, all of the amenities. But the one thing though, that I've learned when it comes to investing in units is that there's a massive body corporate that comes with it. I think my body corporate is about 1,500 a quarter. I mean, that's, yeah, it's up there. And it is, and, and um, you know, the only reason why it's up there is because of the rooftop oh. pool, the rooftop, everything, you know, and that does get it up there. Thankfully, it has been offset by the rent mm-hmm. um, because we were able to increase our rent, but it is up there when it comes to body corporate. And so I have plans of buying a house. I would like a house and land you know, so that we can kind of put aside the body corporate cost. I understand there's still going to be other costs associated, but at least not body corporate. So a house in either Whit Sundays or Mackay or Bendigo or New Norfolk is my current places that I'm looking at at the moment. Well, we'll definitely have to get you back on the show once you do work out exactly where that house will be and and get that all sorted. But dear Swati, thank you so much for your time today. It's been wonderful to chat, um, not only through your own personal journey in property investment, but also the fact that you've shared so much too um, about your individual story is, is really important to us. And we really appreciate that you've been able to do that. Yeah. Awesome stuff. We'll, we'll get you back on the show very, very soon. Thank you so much. To everyone who is listening, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like or review us on whatever platform that you do listen to your podcasts on. If you have any questions or you are a female investor out there who is willing to also take the plunge and share their story, reach out, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Stay up to date with us on our social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and make sure you subscribe to all the latest updates on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. AU. That's all we have time for today. Until next episode, stay safe and well. Bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.